I'll begin with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. You were a member of the Apollo 14 lunar expedition. That took place in 1971. You became the sixth human being to set foot on the moon. A couple of years later, you founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences. That's not about outer space. What's this organization really all about? Well, until this century, the study of consciousness was a, not a proper subject in science. And that goes back uh, almost 500 years to the time of Rene Descartes when he wrote a famous paper that said body, mind, physicality, spirituality were different realms of reality that didn't interact. Well, that had a noble purpose at that time. It got the Spanish Inquisition off the backs of the intellectual of Europe so they could bring them to the state for disagreeing with the church provided they stayed away from mind and consciousness. And that has persisted until the end of the 19th century, when, um, <coughs> uh, who, who am I talking about? When uh, uh, I'm Albert Einstein and um, Max Planck, and Max Planck uh, Albert Einstein and Max Planck, in their studies, uh, produced what now in the 20th century became the study of quantum mechanics and demonstrated that uh, Descartes was wrong, that mind and body do interact and that whether we have an interaction, but it's taken the entire 20th century to bring the quantum world into understanding what consciousness and mind are all about. And uh, that we're, what we're really doing with, and one of the things I'd say is, we say that intuition in the English language, we call it our sixth sense, but in reality it be, should be called our first sense because it's rooted in the quantum world, which is very fundamental and more fundamental than just the matter around us. It's the, the uh, interaction of particles at the subatomic level. Okay, so we're talking about a phenomenon that involves subjective human experience, but we're also talking about physics subatomic particles, quantum reality, that sort of thing. During your moon flight, you conducted a number of, re of controversial experiments about the nature of human consciousness. That was more than a generation ago, and many of our listeners are probably not even alive when all of this occurred. Can you tell us about these experiments? What were you looking for? What experiments did you conduct, and what were the results? Okay, I just conducted some of the uh, reconducted from space some of the experiments that Dr. Um, J.B. Ryan at Duke University had been doing in uh, psychology and parapsychology for a long time. I took some of his uh, procedures and reproduced them in space, and we got as good results as thousands of miles out in space as he got with uh, individuals next door to each other in the laboratory. So that helped help show us that it was a, we're dealing with a quantum phenomenon, which is not as bound by the laws of physics and the speed of light as some of the other properties that we're looking at. Okay, let's go into this for a moment or so, Dr. Mitchell. The experiments demonstrated something about the speed of light, the, the speed limit in the universe, the physical universe, as scientists understand it and has, as our popular culture understands it, nothing can go faster than light. And you're saying that something different was demonstrated in these experiments? Go into that a little bit. I think uh, Rudy, Rudy Schild, Dr. Schild, will agree with me on this, that that's exactly what the quantum entanglement world is all about, is that uh, when particles at the subatomic angle, subatomic level, are entangled in a process, and they go apart from each other. They maintain the correlation that they set up regardless of where they go. At least that's what our quantum science tells us at this point in time. Okay, so you actually discovered that information was transmitted faster than light. How far away were you from Earth at that time? Well, halfway to the moon at least, which is a couple of thousand, uh, 20,000 or so miles minimum. So you were more than 20,000 miles out in space on your way to the moon. You reenacted J.B. Ryan's historic psychic experiments, 
and you how were you able to tell that that information was transmitted faster than light well we're only i can't don't tell that we're only relying upon what the uh, quantum mechanics tells us about non-locality, which is the property we're talking about here. It goes beyond what I did in space. Okay, but the experiments proved something, and they proved that you weren't dealing with electromagnetic transmissions from a one radio to another. Is that the case? That is true. And uh, I, I had sent my results that we got from the space experiment back to Dr. Ryan and to another scientist that had been doing the same work, Dr. Carlos Osis in New York. And they checked the results and said, yes, we were getting the same results that they've got in the laboratory. Okay. So could you just describe very quickly what the experiments were? Because many people alive today probably don't know those pioneering efforts of J.B. Ryan. Well, I would have to dig out of the... Uh, <coughs> out of the, my safes here where I've got it, but it was really uh, just to think about numbers uh, in a particular sequence, and uh, uh, that's what I was thinking about, and uh, I was writing down, and the people that were working with me were writing down their results, and we, we compared them by sending them to Dr. Ryan and Dr. Osis and let them check the results, and they told us that, that the results were exactly the same as though uh, they, they were in the room next to each other. This is extremely significant. Are you suggesting this was mental telepathy from deep space? That's exactly what it was. Very interesting. Okay. Very provocative. And that was more than four decades ago. In the years since your lunar mission, you've become an advocate for a new controversial model in physics, something called a quantum hologram. Can you describe what this is, and why is this idea important to our understanding of human consciousness and the paranormal? Well, I'll let others help answer the latter part of that question, but I'll tell you what it is. At the end of the 19th century, Max Planck made the discovery that all matter emits uh, particles or photons, energy, information, and uh, it, does, it does that continuously. And that's called, and what Max Planck, no, I'm sorry, what Walter Schimp, Dr. Walter Schimp, another German scientist, discovered uh, just in the last 25 years, is that those emissions are quantum entangled and carry the information of the physical object and that's what we call that a quantum hologram and that information kind of like the ancients had the idea that nature didn't lose its experience that's showing us the same thing that the quantum hologram is that nature's way of of saving of saving its experience and we call that in the area of the zero point energy field which is the deepest part of uh, we understand of uh, actual space or actual existence. And I'll invite Rudy to chill to get on and comment on any of this as well. Okay, well, Dr. Shield, you're a quantum physicist and a cosmologist. You work at Harvard at the Harvard Smithsonian Astronomical Observatory. Why don't you jump in here and describe for us the nature of this quantum hologram that Dr. Mitchell has, has described in a general sense? I would love to, and I would start out with the fact that in the time of the 1920s era, when we were becoming very fascinated by all the wonderful agreement between quantum physics and observations of particle physics, um, we understood that there must be some quantum description of all matter, but nobody was ever able to satisfactorily answer the question of just exactly what is waving or what is the medium. I think the modern view is that if you suggest it's something like the ether, you're real close. But in my view, it's really an attribute of space itself. And um, we find that it's most easily understood by seeing space as a, a mathematics of functions of a complex variable or the theory of imaginary numbers, that the space of the quantum waving seems to be 
a uh, aspect of the universe which has, in addition to the three spatial dimensions, each spatial dimension has this attribute of supporting the quantum wave. So it is space itself that is waving, but in another kind of dimensional aspect. Now, please, I do not go to string theory. String theory says, oh, you mean a six-dimensional space or an eight-dimensional space, and I say no. I say I mean what Einstein meant, a four-dimension or three dimensions of space and time space, but those four dimensions have a imaginary or a, a separate aspect to them, and so what we have in our physical universe is all of the physics that we can see plus an unseen part. And that's the quantum hologram. That's the quantum description part of our real space. Not uh, a string theory component in the general sense, but rather a very restrictive form of string theory if you want to look at it that way. So let's get back to what Dr. Mitchell was describing in terms of these telepathy experiments from deep space on his way to the moon. He sent thought patterns back to Earth that were picked up by people. Where were they, Dr. Mitchell? Were they in Houston at the Space Center? Were they at Dr. Ryan's university? Where was, were the recipients of this information? Uh, they were scattered around. There were some in Chicago. There were some here and there. I don't remember all their location, but they were here in the United States at the time. And they simultaneously picked up the same thought patterns? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Dr. Shield, how's that possible? Yes, that's the fun part. And so, as Edgar said himself uh, just minutes ago, we understand that everything is entangled because of its connection to a single one quantum hologram. And it means that just as particles are entangled, so also information is entangled and the information is entangled and, and interacts with our brain. And so the complex pattern is particles in the universe interact with each other in quantum space, and the brain interacts with that same quantum space. Thank you. So basically what you're describing is that we're all part of some sort of integrated whole but the pattern by which that whole is integrated with itself has yet to be deciphered. Is that a fair statement? Um, yes, that's a fair statement. And um, this pattern is manifest uh, in, re in physical reality as a lot of phase relationships in particles and atoms. And so all matter through its atomic properties and going on to subatomic properties is entangled in this way. Okay, let's back up for our, our listeners. We're, we're talking physicist to physicist here, and we, <laughs> we're also dealing with people listening, and a lot of them probably don't know what we're talking about. So I'm going to try to summarize something. I would like Dr. Mitchell and, and Dr. Shield to pick up on some of the concepts that I'm going to uh, put forth here. But it sounds like what both of you are stating is that everything is in a state of vibration. And those vibrations are sort of like in tuning fork resonance relationships to one another. And it doesn't matter where you are in space, but part of your vibrational pattern is correlated to the vibrational pattern of somewhere else in space, whether you're on the moon or whether you're in a laboratory on Earth, it is possible to simultaneously vibrate in the same way. Is that, is that an accurate description? Edgar, I leave it to you. That's the chapter of your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can only say yes. It sounds like it's, that's right, but I can't, I don't have a way to prove that one way or the other. I'm, I'm simply trying to reframe the statements 
without the particulars so that the general listener will get a clearer picture. But in essence, it, it's sort of like vibrations will set off other vibrations, but intrinsically we're all vibrating anyway, but we're vibrating in concert with one another. That's the picture that is being painted here, folks. So take that into consideration. A part of your vibrating pattern is also available to somebody else's vibrating pattern. And according to these two scientists, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're on the moon or Proxima Centauri or in New York City, it's possible to pick up that information. It, it, does, does that make any sense? That's in terrific, Ralph. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to add one very critical comment that's of interest more to the technocrats among your listeners. And that would be that for this to be true, remember that this vibration has to be instantaneous. In other words, whatever field that the quantum mechanics guys couldn't really identify in the 20s, that field must carry information over vast distances um, uh, instantaneously. Now, in fact, that is a quantum description that has been confirmed by those experiments by Szilard uh, in Europe, um, where he showed that um, information that Einstein called spooky action at a distance, information of this resonance kind does belong to particles and is manifest in some vibrating pattern in space. And we physicists like to have something that we can call that, and we call it the quantum hologram. Are we zeroing in, Ralph? You sound like you're really approaching a critical series of issues here, and I think we need to bring them out for our audience, and that is that this connection is instantaneous. Now, there's a preconception in the world of science and in the world of popular physics that nothing can go faster than light and that light is the purveyor of all information, and therefore you have to wait the time that it takes for information to travel vast distances before you know about something else. And what you're stating, Dr. Shield, is that this quantum hologram with its multitude of interconnected vibrations is enabling information to occur instantaneously over vast distances. Is that correct? That's correct, exactly as you say. And maybe with an example, I can even emphasize one aspect, and that is, you know, Many Christians in our civilization believe that there is prayer. So do the is, is, um, uh, Islamics. And um, we believe that prayer um, is heard somehow by the cosmic intelligence and by the universe. But when you think about it, in a human lifetime, which is 60 years, at the speed of light, your prayer could only get to within 60 light years within the universe. Well, 60 light years only encompasses maybe a couple hundred stars. It's not a very big piece of space. And so how do we imagine that um, our com cosmic intelligence, our creator, is hearing our prayer if, in fact, at the speed of light, prayer can only go a short distance among the stars? So in some senses... Our civilization has been acting on the fact that prayer must somehow propagate through the universe much faster than at the speed of light. And that's only one small example of what we're talking about. So what we're talking about is the speed of thought. The speed of thought is of a, di of a different fish swimming in a deeper sea than the speed of light. Beautiful. And I agree entirely. The speed of thought is apparently instantaneous throughout the universe or an infinite speed. Okay. Dr. Mitchell, you have stated that this quantum hologram with all of its complex interactions can actually be an explanation for how psychic phenomena and the paranormal works. Can you explain that to us? No, I can't explain it any better than Rudy just did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can say it's the experiments that we have conducted, and it seems to work the way the experiments show instantaneously, but uh, can't go further than that. <laughs> okay. Well, there are a number of phenomena that people are concerned about, particularly those 
folks who do have interactions with supposed extraterrestrials. Or suppose you're an individual who's gifted with precognition or mental telepathy or remote viewing. Or perhaps you're a military officer who is trained to view distant locations in your mind and you get to, you get direct pictures. I've experienced that, actually. And we want to know how all of this is able to take place. So oh, <laughs> what, ab- what about mental telepathy? What about precognition? What about remembering memories from previous lives? These are phenomena that are, are, are experienced by millions of humans around the world. They're reported to scientists. Scientists are scratching their heads. Is it possible that this quantum hologram concept can possibly tell us how all of this is happening? Well, let's, let's uh, say precognition is something a little different because uh, it is talking about uh, something happening in the future that you know about now without having the evidence. So that has to be something quite different because uh, we haven't included in our thinking here the fact that uh, uh, we are using time when we talk about precognition. We're talking about something in the future that hasn't happened yet. And uh, that's something different than instant being instantaneous. Uh, and I'm not, I can't say any more about that. Maybe Rudy can, but I can't. Okay. Dr. Shield, do you have any insight into how precognition may be possible? Um, it is so complicated that I think you wouldn't like to hear it, um, Ralph. I'm sorry on this one. Um, it's kind of a zero because um, you get into what the, the questions about what the universe actually is and um, uh, the issues of uh, does uh, information pass from the horizon of the universe to us as individuals um, uh, backwards. But this is, uh, this is a much more complicated discussion. <laughs> okay. But we, for the record, we want to acknowledge for our audience that the phenomenon of precognition exists. I'm a scientific investigator trained in physics, and I've had precognitive events, and I can say that it's very, very real. So <laughs> from subjective experience to scratching my head about subjective experience, I'd like to know the physics behind it because it is real. And I've talked to a lot of other folks who have had those experiences as well. Okay. Um, the issue of UFOs and communication with extraterrestrial intelligence or interdimensional intelligence, that's a big, broad subject of interest to our audience. Most people tuning into this radio program are interested to find out about their contact experiences, and they also want, if they're general, general, of general interest, whether or not the planet is actually being visited by extraterrestrials. Now, a big issue is how would they possibly get there from here? or here from there, because the vast distances between the stars. You two are physicists that deal with the complexities of quantum mechanics. Dr. Shield, you deal with relativity as well. Can you offer any explanation, either of you, as to how so-called aliens could possibly get halfway ar- across the galaxy and visit us when we can't even get to Mars over a period of years? Um. I think um, Edgar might like me to take this one on um, because um, it does involve um, quantum physics and a a slightly different attribute of it. So um, imagine that what the spacecraft is actually doing is amplifying human intent and Um, This is not hypothetical. People who have been aboard spacecraft and who have discussed with alien beings report that this is something like the way the spacecraft works. So if I may persist with this a bit, um, imagine that you have in the UFO craft a very large amplifier of consciousness. And the amplification of consciousness allows the operators to project their experience of existence to another place, and that because they, the operators, have to some extent 
perhaps through remote viewing, have been to that place and their minds can fix upon it. And so consciousness and the human mind act as kind of the go-between, needing amplification of the UFO craft to join together in entanglement the two spaces so that what will actually happen is that according to the spacecraft's operation, the information of the craft itself and the occupants gets projected to the new location and a person witnessing this will see something like we saw in Star Trek with the Beam Me Up Scotty transporter. You will see that where the spacecraft is leaving, it suddenly fades out. And where the spacecraft is remanifesting, you will first see these events take place over about four seconds. And the first second, you'll suddenly notice, oh, there's some fuss over there. But you don't see anything. That's for the second moment. In the second second, you will see a vague outline of the spacecraft, but colorless and semi-transparent, except, oh, in the third second, you will see that, oh, it's no longer transparent, and it now has color, and now, in the fourth second, you will see, oh, it's achieved its gravity, it's here, I can interact it with a conscious, sentient mind. That's what you would actually see as these events are occurring. And can you see then that this is the demanifestation of the spacecraft in one location and then the re-manifestation um, as a trick of entanglement? So what you're saying is that they're, they're able to think their craft to distant locations. Is, is that... Yes. Uh, and that, that thinking process is assisted by the spacecraft itself. Now, I'm told that the spacecraft has several attributes that assist this, that very often it takes three or four operators uh, to operate in this mode. They place their hands in sensors, and these sensors pick up the vibrations due to their consciousness, and that's what then gets emphasized by the spacecraft. I'm told that the engine or the power source is some kind of a um, plasma in which there are things that pop, 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 pop. Things just happen within this plasma, and I interpret that to mean that these are some kind of noise generators. They generate vast amounts of general, of general noise, but that... Um, human consciousness can guide and amplify some bits of this noise, and that's the part that guides the spacecraft. I'm also understanding that the bottom, which is normally an open hole, as it's described on a spacecraft, very often is seen to have something like a glowing crystal, something like a liquid crystal that's changing and, and varying and displaying energy properties that we can't immediately see, but that's the energy leaving the spacecraft. Now, this is not proved within science. This is anecdotal uh, uh, um, stories that are given to me, and I consider it the best information we have. Okay, this, this is extremely provocative information because I'm sure a lot of people in our audience have had these sighting experiences, myself included, and to get some sort of an explanation under our belt as to what we're seeing represents is, is quite an honor, and I thank you for those descriptions, and I will certainly think about them. I've read a lot of the same reports you have, and we should compare notes when, when we're done with this interview. But I'd like to go back to the fundamentals of the UFO experience because a lot of people who are listening to this program haven't taken that leap to even accept the reality of the phenomenon yet. And what I'm aiming toward is to present a case that the phenomenon 
is not just mythology, that it's real, that the people who experience it need to be given the credence to be heard. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, over the past 20 years, you have been speaking out about UFOs, and you've taken a very firm pro-UFO position, particularly when it comes to a very famous case here in the United States, the case of Roswell, the so-called physical crash retrieval of a, for lack of better better terminology, an alien spacecraft or an ET craft in the desert of Roswell, New Mexico in July of 1947. And you have a connection to that. Uh, you, you grew up in, in the town of Artesia, which is the closest town to the town of Roswell. So during your, your early years as an adolescent, this event took place. And apparently you, you knew about it. Uh, what convinces you that this particular case is valid and that the media in the United States and scientists around the world need to continue to take it, take it seriously as evidence? Well, the point is that I knew many of the people, of the citizens, uh, uh, or in, I, a couple of the citizens that were there personally, but a large portion of it due to their children, whom I uh, was able to interview after I had come back from the moon, which is several years later. But the one of the uh, persons that I knew, his... Uh, uh, grandparent, I believe it was, was the undertaker that provided the coffins for the alien bodies. Another one was a descendant of uh, the sheriff's, uh, one of the sheriffs that was patrolling around the crash sites and keeping traffic away from the crash sites. Another person that I knew was an office, not an office mate, but li had offices in the same uh, Air Force building as the uh, Marcel, Jesse Marcel, the major who brought in the alien bodies and brought in the evidence from the crash sites. So these are all people that had close to first-hand knowledge of the Roswell crash. And uh, although I did not have first-hand knowledge, was, I was there at the time. And on one day, the Roswell Daily Record said it was an alien spacecraft crash. The next day, thanks to the Air Force, they uh, said, no, it wasn't an alien spacecraft, it was a weather balloon. And that story persisted for a long time until uh, the real word got out from the various more credible sources that no, there really was a spacecraft that crashed. So does that mean that you have actually spoken to a number of people about what they saw firsthand? It sounds like they actually approached you when you came back from the moon. Is that what ha what occurred? Well, I went back. I was doing some lectures in the Pecos Valley, which is where Roswell and Artesia are located. And these people uh, who were descendants uh, came to me, but also the major who was, uh, uh, let's just say, an office mate, but not quite an office mate of Jesse Marcel, was a friend of the family, and he, he validated the experience himself. You and I attended a closed conference back in 1995. That's where you and I met Dr. Mitchell. It was the opening salvo of an endeavor that later became known as the Disclosure Project. And this was in uh, Silomar Conference Center on the California coast in Monterey, California. And among the guests who attended that conference was the son of of Major Jesse Marcel, and I met the Major Marcel's son for the very first time there. Uh, he was there attending the conference with a man who had reconstructed a memory that Jesse Jr. had of actually having touched some of the debris that his father brought home from the field where the crash occurred. Do you, yes, that, do you recall that conversation with Jesse Marcel Jr. and and his memory reconstruction of an I beam? What was that all about? Yes, I've had several conversations with Jesse Marcel Jr. Uh, well, it all just goes to say that if it's all authentic, that's the big big answer you can bring out of it. Uh, I can't remember any detail details of the 
of the fine details of the conversation are. But he did have very clear memory of touching this material. So it was physically real and it was, well, what did he tell you about it in your conversation well, with Jesse Marcel Jr.? I brought some of it home and showed it to he and his mother uh, before he took it in and reported it uh, uh, into the base itself. And I can't remember, I don't remember what pieces there were, pieces of metal or whatever, but it was just pieces that, that Jesse Marcel brought back from the crash site and showed it to his family before he turned it into the Air Force. There's an enormous amount of secrecy that still surrounds that event and the UFO subject in general with respect to our government and other governments around the world. You've been in the military. You were a fighter pilot in the Navy. You have been a test pilot. You have flown to the moon and back, and you know a lot of people on the inside of government. Why do you think the government is still keeping this information a secret when so many people yearn to know the truth? Well, I can't answer why government, but it seems like it's bigger than government. I would suspect, now this is just a, a suspicion and a theory, that it more has to do with uh, keeping something secret that might have financial ramifications in the future if it handled right. In other words, as is often the case in the corporate world, where there's money involved, uh, that's the reason for the secrecy. That's quite possible. And uh, because it's, I know that, uh, for example, when President Clinton was president, he sent uh, a person to Edward Air Force, not Edward, to the Air Force Base. Uh, Wright Patterson in Dayton. Patterson or Air Force Base. And he was denied access to it, too. So that's getting out of government. Now we're getting to something larger than government. We're getting to the fact that there's economic value here that somebody hopes to reward a gain from it in the future, I believe. Uh, there may be another explanation. I don't know what it is, if, if there is one. Do you think there are beneficial technologies that can be derived from studying UFOs as physical technology? And, and it, as a corollary to that, are there any hidden dangers associated, potential hidden dangers associated with that technology? I can't frankly answer either one of those positively, but uh, I, I think certainly if it's a technology of communication or transportation, certainly the ETs, extraterrestrials, know that pretty well, and sooner or later we will know it too from our own experiences or from them sharing it with us. I'm going to ask a sensitive question that I ask of everybody. Have you personally seen a UFO, Dr. Mitchell? No, I have not. Have other astronauts ever told you about having seen UFOs or had encounters with UFOs? Well, some have, but not necessarily during their flight or anything. They've uh, just a different part of their life. Dr. Shield, I want to ask you the same question. Have you personally ever seen or experienced a UFO? No, I have not. I've never seen one. And have people ever come forward who claim to have been involved with government projects, who might have had hands-on experience with such technology, ever confided in you or told you about that? No, I have to say I don't know uh, any of the, um, the governmental operatives, and they've never contacted me. Uh, so I have no no contact with um, this uh, this op other side. I would like to tell you though that just following um, newspaper accounts, you can see that as Edgar Mitchell is trying to tell us, this is much bigger than just a government because uh, it's clearly bigger than the United States government. Let's recall that another very prominent event was the Phoenix Lights. Um, this was, this happened about 10 years ago um, at about 11 o'clock in the evening in Phoenix, Arizona. A humongous spacecraft was seen um, crossing from horizon to horizon. The event lasted many minutes, perhaps a quarter hour or so. And um, if you read newspaper accounts for that period, you will find that there was a big flap about this 
from a much earlier time, an hour earlier, uh, on the Oregon coast where the object was first seen, and then reports uh, a quarter hour later came from uh, interior Oregon, and then yet later um, there was more events noticed when the object crossed from Oregon to Nevada, and um, finally the object, uh, after again a half hour pause or so, was seen over Phoenix, Arizona, uh, whence it disappeared. Now, now, the official Air Force explanation is that, oh, some people saw some testing of flares or a program of government flights involving flare activity, and people were reporting the light of flares. But I'm sure that those people who saw this event would not agree to that in any way. And is it even imaginable that if an aircraft were operating in our most sensitive airspace, namely that region of Northern California uh, and Nevada, where we do our secret missile and aircraft testing, that in the hour and a half or so that this activity was going on, the government couldn't launch a couple of F-15s and shoot it down? I mean, come on, guys. We have a military that's prepared to defend the homeland, don't we? Where was the homeland defense? Or should I understand that, in fact, the government is in on it? Your call. Either. Go ahead, Edgar. Go ahead. I happen to think, since Rudy brought up the uh, uh, Phoenix Lights uh, event, I happen to have been on the uh, telephone with one of the observers in Phoenix when this happened. And uh, I got a blow-by-blow description as the spacecraft went over the site and was uh, uh, tracked by some very good observers at the time it was happening. So I had a I was a, a second-hand account, but at the time it was going on, it was a description of an observer in Phoenix. And it, that was quite an event. If I could, if I could add to that, Ralph, please. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Edgar. Um, as it turns out, the event occurred just in the late evening hours, or maybe maybe a little bit later, but in the er- in the early part of the night. So there are many, many people in the cool of the evening sky, sitting out on on decks, uh, enjoying their barbecues and enjoying the sight of the night sky, and. Many, many reports flooded the news media, television stations, radio stations, anybody who would listen, police departments, uh, first responders were being advised of this. And you cannot say it was anything but an enormous flap, so big that, in fact, uh, Fife Symington, the governor of the state, was required or uh, was upon demand, felt, ob- uh, uh, felt obliged to appear on television and comment on it, even though he had absolutely nothing to say. Uh, it's just that nobody can un- explain it, and yet uh, the stories that come from our government simply seem not to hold water. So, uh, your call. Okay, I'm going to add an anecdote to this story. Uh, this occurred in 1997. It wasn't 10 years ago, so it was a bit longer back. But nevertheless, Governor Fife Symington, back in 2006, fessed up to investigative journalist Leslie Kane and filmmaker James Fox that he intentionally debunked the phenomenon when he himself was a witness. He he basically had a had his chief of staff dress up in an, in an alien costume, held a press conference, and made fun of. Francis Barwood, who was one of the city council members in Phoenix, and it literally ruined her political career. He did that in public. And years later, he apologized and said that, well, I was standing right there and I saw the craft myself, but I didn't want to panic people. So I went ahead and, and, and held a funny press conference. It was He was claiming a naive gesture to ward off public panic. But he was complicit with the reaction of officialdom to the phenomenon, and that is to pass it off as something insignificant or something to be laughed at. And and I would like to point out that over the decades since Roswell, that is pretty much how 
the government and the media have dealt with the phenomenon in general. As a result, we don't have the scientific community willing to look at the UFO evidence. And there's very robust evidence. Another aspect of this that I would like both of you to address is the enormity of the evidence as anomalous. And when you have violations of the supposed laws of physics as we think we know them, you cannot offer explanations to scientists. You cannot offer explanations to theologians. You cannot offer explanations to the public. And people fear the unknown. So there's another reason for keeping it quiet. But the knee-jerk reaction is to laugh about it. What do both of you think about that phenomenon? Edgar? I can do is agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I said a lot there. I, sh I probably should have asked you specific questions, but I needed to bring that forward. Here you had the governor of uh, Arizona confessing to become being complicit in a cover-up that he was naive of. So that in itself is interesting sociology. All right. Well, so could I add, could I um, answer for a, a little bit, Ralph? Sure. Uh, the question. So. Um, Part of the mystery uh, comes about because, as you point out correctly, Ralph, we have no explanations uh, that we can offer to theologians, to social scientists, to psychiatrists and psychologists, and to just ordinary people for what exactly is going on. Now, I can tell you that uh, physics is not completely empty-handed here. That is to say, we know that there is this phenomenon of weightlessness involved. The spacecraft was seen operating weightlessly, no jet thr thrusters. Again, going back to the Phoenix Lights now. The Phoenix Lights craft was seen operating silently, majestically, no jet thrusters in evidence holding it up. So we're driven to conclude that some kind of anti-gravity me mechanism must be at play here. And now I can offer some help because we do apparently have in our civilization examples of anti-gravity induced by consciousness. And so we know of the very long tradition of Buddhist monks who are able to levitate themselves uh, in the act of meditation. So are those things related? I would say emphatically yes. That whatever the monks are doing, they are amplifying the spiral form consciousness waves that pervade their body, that pervade all of our bodies, but they in meditation are able to um, concentrate them the most strongly, typically in groups of a number of monks practicing. Now, we believe that this uh, vorticity of consciousness is an actual, oh dear, I'm getting into mathematics again. This next part, um, you should go to the beach for a minute if you're not a physicist or a mathematician. So, we understand that the consciousness waves have vorticity, means that they are spinning and advancing as they spin, uh, in the quantum world, this is called helicity. It is a known quantum phenomena, and it is known that quantum helicity is a state that has energy levels and can be um, uh, experimented with much like um, the quantum nature of existence itself. And so, if the helicity of human consciousness can be activated and amplified by the spacecraft, then you have it, because helicity is the off-diagonal elements in the Einstein general relativity field equation, and their existence in that stress-energy tensor description means that they interact with gravity. So the basic machinery of gravity is being amplified by the spacecraft machine, and that is causing the weightlessness that seems to make them easily propelled through the sky. You may all come back from the beach now. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, well, that is a wonderful explanation for anti-gravity. I will ask, I'd like to ask you a technical question, and I don't want to go into it in too much detail for our audience, but as one scientist to another, is it possible to access those helicity uh, vector components through modulating the electromagnetic field? In other words, can you use an electromagnetic phasing pulse to modulate gravity through some sort of transform? Is it possible to do that? Um, I would have, I have a suspicion the answer is no, and I know of no actual evidence one way or the other. The reason for my suspicion is that what I understand of the relativity theory is that um, the vorticity needs to replay, to be um, seen at a distance or needs to be seen operating at a um, moment vector. I'm sorry, I'm appealing to my, I'm falling back on my uh, technical vocabulary here. Let's just say um, a photon is just a spinning wave, whereas what we need is spinning mass. And if we can't have a manifestation of mass, at least we can maybe have the quantum effects of mass. And that, in a quantum field theory, will allow this vorticity to operate for a massive object in a different way than for a photon. Uh, yeah. yeah. I totally agree with what Rudy had just said. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Edgar. All right. Those are things for scientists to ponder, and I intend to ponder them because I'm very interested in how you achieve a technology that can match and with parity what our visitors, supposed visitors, are able to achieve because what that would mean would give us the ability to visit them. So that would be a change for the human condition. We'll get there in due course. I, I believe we will, but we need to take many more steps toward our basic humanity before we're safe throwing around a cudgel of that magnitude, and I think visitors would probably agree with that statement. I agree, yep. Okay. People will, will report when they encounter non-human beings that they're able to walk through walls. There, there are a lot of reports about people in either abduction scenarios or contact experience scenarios where they report being teleported through floors and ceilings and up into a craft. How could this possibly occur from the standpoint of quantum physics? I think it's just a point. Uh, I don't think either of us can answer that question very well, but it is the fact that our physics, our understanding of physics is very limited at this point. That's of matter and so forth. And all of the objects we have around us have different forms than we really think they are, than we have per currently uh, explored and explained at this point in time. We have a ways to go. I, I agree with Edgar. Um, I want to offer just a little more of an idea here without uh, being uh, an expert because um, I don't pretend to be able to do this, actually. But I want to point out um, that remember that the atom is an almost empty region of space. You have a tiny little proton uh, uh, or a cluster of protons and neutrons and then a bunch of electrons whizzing around. But by and large, the atom itself is space. And so... Um, a wall actually is a lot of space inside of the atoms constituting the wall. And so if our own atoms, meaning our protons and electrons, can be phased correctly, then probably it's possible to arrange that the spaces between our atoms match up with the existence of protons and neutrons in the wall. And that the careful alignment of all of this is done again through the quantum hologram because all of the information about where the particles in the wall are is in the quantum hologram. And when we learn to access that, and I haven't done that, uh, but when we learn how, in principle, we can squeeze our atomic structure between 
the protons, neutrons, and electrons of the wall. Something like that must evidently be at play. One of the subjects that comes up when people discuss UFOs and intelligence from elsewhere is that they've somehow been able to survive their own foibles and predispositions towards self-destruction. And here on Earth, we're facing a mighty challenge, that of global climate change and the ravaging of our planet's ecosystem. Do either of you believe that the UFO subject offers anything that could be used to help ameliorate the fossil fuel contamination uh, problem on planet Earth, our energy crisis, and reverse the damage of global warming. I think our our visitors, our ET visitors, could help us with that if they choose to do so, and if we learn how to communicate with them properly. And communicating with them properly as opposed to improperly, what would be proper communication and what, what are we doing improperly? I think Rudy just said it. We can walk through, should be able to walk through walls if we have it down right. <laughs> uh, let me more directly answer that, if I might, Ralph. Um, we understand first from some of the friendly uh, ETs that have interacted with humans that it's not entirely an accident that they are here at this time. What they have said is that the explosions at Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II, the nuclear detonations, made in fear and anger, have sent a shocking signal throughout the universe as a very powerful part of the quantum, wa uh, quantum hologram wave. The universe has responded by saying, these people are in trouble, we understand the nature of the trouble to some extent because we have survived a similar uh, experience and what we will do is try to upgrade their civilization with knowledge and technology. First, technologies to help us um, save our planet from global warming and other effects and we know that there is a great deal of conscious awareness in our civilization today that I did not experience as a boy in the 1940s era. And so I do agree that at the same time that there has been this greater UFO uh, awareness and communication, there seems to have also been an increase in awareness of these ecological problems. Now, that does not directly connect the two dots. It only notices a time coincidence. However, I think there is every reason to understand or believe that the UFO abduction program apparently offers guidance for the way forward if we learn to listen. And I hope that um, we do not end up in fear of this, but rather come to appreciate their efforts, which are intended to avoid the problems of the nuclear conflagrations at the end of the World War II. Thank you, Rudy, and I totally agree with your, your expression of hope there. I'd like to bring up the issue of cleaner sources of energy. And Dr. Mitchell, you have often stated that the zero point energy at the root of the quantum vacuum could be a resource that could help humanity on a number of fronts. You have worked with Dr. Harold Putoff at Stanford calculating uh, the access point on how to, how to get at energy that is vibrating at, at near absolute zero but could be a potential clean source of electrical power. Could you explain that? Edgar, you're first. <laughs> no, I don't think I can explain that. <laughs> cool. Let me first then, uh, if I might chime in here. Um, in the first place, the vacuum zero-point energy 
which is also sometimes called the renormalization constant, uh, is a very interesting critter. Um, we are reasonably aware that it must exist because when we do quantum mechanical calculations, we have some sense of how much quantum energy has to be associated with um, a simple atom or a simple assembly of atoms. But what we're finding is that when we look for that experimentally, the amount of energy we find is vastly greater. And by vastly, I imagine a number which is a one with 100 zeros stretched out after it. That's the magnitude of this vacuum zero point energy or this cosmological constant. And I'm sorry, I should not have said cosmological constant. Um, now, um, some people like Frank Wilczek have said, you know, this is the most important question facing our physical theory today. But I think that it's kind of a no-brainer and has a very simple understanding. We have actually computed up how much is the total amount of energy that should be our entire universe's contribution to this renormalization constant or vacuum zero point energy. And we know that it is this number one with a hundred zeros after it, larger than uh, that the real value is, uh, the measured value is a thousand times larger than, a hundred times larger than we can account for. Now, if we simply assume that our universe is an average universe and that this vacuum zero point energy is the energy that describes not only our universe, but actually all universes, then if we take that the amount that we measure for our universe is normal for a universe, then we have measured the number of universes. And the number of universes is that same number. In other words, the number of universes in the universe of universes would be one with a hundred zeros after it. Now, that is a very, very large number, of course, but it's very important to realize that it's not infinite. And in understanding the properties of the universe and its creation, it's very, very important to see that the number that we find is a large but finite number, not infinite. We're now getting into the subject of a multiverse, and this is something that um, I think for the second half of our program we can go into in some depth. <clears throat> we, we don't live in one universe according to quantum cosmologists, and there are variations on the theme, but I'm wondering if this has anything to do with the UFO phenomenon and anything to do with our travelers and visitors, because here you have the possibility that not only is our universe finite, but there are other finite universes that might have completely different evolutionary histories to compare to ours. And is it possible for beings to cross over from one universe to another? And are we being visited by intelligences that are hyper intelligences? These are the speculation realms from science fiction. But nevertheless, scientists are dealing with these issues and are proposing potential scenarios that, that need to be investigated. And that brings up the issue of communication and communication with other intelligences from elsewhere, whether they're from other universes or from a, a higher level of, of cognition within our own universe. And the one topic I want to bring up before I forget about it and move on to physics in general and cosmology is the issue of channeling. Do either of you two scientists believe that the phenomenon of channeled information is valid for scientific study. Um, I know that Edgar doesn't like to speculate. Um, so we'll let the younger guy do it. <laughs> okay. okay, we'll, we'll have to that. ask Dr. Mitchell some very specific and pointed questions about the subject. But go ahead, Rudy. Um, 
many people um, have noticed that if you imagine being that cosmic intelligence, and um, we use that word in science to avoid the G star star word. So if the cosmic intelligence were, being, were building a cosmos, it or he or she would build it almost exactly as we see, where there is an attribute, the quantum attribute, in each universe, and that attribute is then shared with all other universes. And then we as scientists can step in and as mathematicians ask, okay, if you have intelligence in a universe and in fact in multiple universes, what would be the sum of all that intelligence? And then... How can that be anything less than the creator? So the sum of all knowledge probably is in some way a manifestation of the creator. But then you see it also turns out that we as sentient beings are creating our creator or and maybe you want to say magnifying his glory. Now, that's not said to me by religious conviction of any kind, but rather to notice that it appears that the way the universe has been constructed and we are measuring it, it just seems to have come out that way or to have been designed in that way so that our universe is a physical structure. It contains its elements of space and time. But then we believe that there are other universes parallel to our own and that those universes have their own space and time and theirs and ours do not connect, meaning I cannot send a light ray from my universe to that other one. They have separate but equal space-time continua. Now... Um, this brings up the possibility that um, all universes are in contact at some level if there is some operator who is supra-universe. In other words, who is in all universes. And how could that be none other than cosmic intelligence? However... Are there other angels or are there other entities in the universe that share this gift? I don't know from personal experience or from any scientific experiment. But to me, it's interesting for the theological community to understand that in the basic fundamental construction of the universe, this possibility exists. You might want to go and say the universe was created for that possibility to exist, but I can't know that. I would like to reiterate a theme that a lot of listeners are very concerned about. Now, we're moving into the domain of spirituality, and we're going to be returning to that subject in our second hour. But at this point, I would like to ask Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Shield, respectively, do either of you feel that the issue of fear and alien abductions versus possible helpful or benign interactions is important for people to be aware of. Because there are a lot of people reporting very frightening interactions with supposed extraterrestrials. The media picks this up and scares the public even more. The military might be responding to that fear. There might be the possibility of weapons of mass destruction getting a boosting from Congress if, it, if they were told in closed committee hearings that we're facing an alien threat. So there's a you know, potential financial motivation to stoke the fires of fear. There are lots of motivations for that on the human side, but do we have anything to fear from our visitors? Um. Again, this is probably getting speculative. Edgar, if I may, and please add anything you find important in this conversation. 
um, what we're being told is that, yes, just as you say, Ralph, there are good players out there and there are a few bad players out there. However, it seems that where the universe is created for a purpose, that its greatest success will be to those who are aligned with the purpose and direction of the universe or in the direction that cosmic intelligence had intended. And therefore, I have always taken the position that most probably the good entities will survive. And you know, it's not so different from what we believe so above, so as here below, that not all people are wonderful. In fact, there are some whom I shall not name, but uh, some who uh, are in the Dictionary of Infamy. Um, so here below, we have this phenomena of there are good uh, good human beings and bad ones, where bad means that they put their own self-interest above the common good. That seems to be the order that's universe-wide. And I would be welcoming of an opinion by Dr. Mitchell. Well, I would have to agree with that. But on the other hand, if we look at the universe as a whole, one can imagine that evil could really exist in it in any significant manner uh, and not as opposed to service to the greater good for it to have happened at all. That we... That, uh, we keep on going and going and going. And to me, this is a suggestion that uh, likely it's all pretty good in the long run if we can just keep going. But, uh, at, at the danger of sounding like I have to have the last word, um, I'd like to add to that something that refers to Ed, Dr. Mitchell's own work. And that is that in his book, The Way of the Explorer, uh, he emphasized the fact that we live in a dyadic universe. And that means that for any attribute in the universe, there has to be also its dyadic opposite. And I picture this as being a quantum wave field, the quantum hologram, which has a positive side and a negative side to it. And so, for there to be any quantum hologram that describes red, or the number three, or wagon, or heart, for that to exist, um, its opposite must exist. So, for hunger, there must be satiation. For fear, there should be elation. And for there to be good in the universe, there would have to be evil. So I believe that as above, so below, there has to be good in the universe, and that is understood to be alignment with the purpose and direction established by the creator of the universe. And evil is contrary to that. And Dr. Mitchell, do you see this as a reasonable corollary to your understanding of the dyadic nature of the universe and the quantum hologram. Yes, I do. On the other hand, I can think I, we can make the argument that the negative side of it can pass away, that it does not have to persist because it takes success to make the uni to really make the universe work. And the part of it that we, that is the opposite side in my opinion, must fall away at some point. Some point. Thank you. Dr. Mitchell, I would like to go back a few steps to talk about concrete evidence so that scientists can listen to this and maybe perk their curiosity up and jump on board this, this quest for knowledge. Zero-point energy the quantum hologram and physical evidence. Your colleague, Dr. Walter Shemp, discovered something in 1992-1993 while working on an MRI machine. And that started a cascade of research on your part. What was it that he discovered? 
Um, just, what Walter Shemp did he discover? Well, Walter Shemp is the one that put the word. If you're at, that's what you're asking. He's uh, the one that uh, discovered or named the quantum hologram and said that it is a consistent uh, entity that has the properties we now understand it to have. But uh, Walter Shemp is the one that brought it in and started talking about it and developing the implications of what we now call a quantum hologram. What, what did he discover with a functional MRI machine in the early 1990s? What was the evidence there? I, I can't answer that. I can't remember that without going looking it up. But I, I really think that this, it simply has to do with the quantum coherence of the emissions that all particles make. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shield, do you have any insight into this particular aspect of the evidence? No, I'm sorry, Ralph. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's a detail, and we can certainly go back into the books to look that up. Um, Dr. Shield, you have done a lot of work with black holes, and from your perspective, this exotic phenomenon in cosmology is intimately related to this proposed quantum hologram. And, and you're actually a, an outlier in the field of black hole research as a cosmologist. You and Stephen Hawking have been uh, gentlemanly sparring on the subject and disagreeing over years, and now he seems to be approaching your interpretation that a black hole is not really a black hole. It's something else. Well, what, is, what do you believe these objects are, and what are their connections to the quantum hologram phenomenon that we're discussing here? Terrific question. And... Um um, uh, the answer would have two kinds. There would be a simplistic answer, and there would be the one to the mathematicians in the audience. So let me try with a, a simplistic answer uh, to begin with. Um, um, in the first place, let's say you have to explain the observations. And as it stands now, the black hole that everybody believes they understand and wants us to understand um, is an object which everything falls into, but nothing comes out of. So then, how exactly does it turn out to be the most luminous object in the universe? And the answer to that dilemma is that it seems to require the existence of a very, very strong magnetic field. And if you want to know what I mean by very, very strong, let's just say if you look at the Earth's magnetic field that guides our compasses, the field that I'm talking about at the black hole is stronger by a factor of a million billion. So that would be 10 with a dozen zeros after it. Now, um, these fields are known to exist in what are called magnetars, which are collapsed stars. At the end of a star's life, it often becomes a supernova, and that leaves a core remnant, which, is called, which then becomes called a magnetar. It is spinning, and... It seems like because it is the iron core of the star, it retained all of the star's magnetic field, but then compressed it to become a black hole or neutron star object. We call it a Miko to emphasize that it has a magnetic attribute. Miko means magnetic, eternally collapsing object. And that's what we think nature makes instead of the classic black hole. But I'm making the point here that there must be a very powerful magnetic field involved. We observe some of these objects as magnetars, but those aren't the black hole case, those are the neutron star case, where the black hole case is an even further collapse than that. So I believe that until we put in surface magnetic fields into the theory as we have done, you can't get an understanding of what the object is. And when you do put that in and carry that through to have an equation of state or 
equations that describe all of this and put that on a computer and compare that with observations, then suddenly you do have a theory that does explain all of these things. And in particular, an important part of the theory is that it allows you to say an answer to an ancient question, why is it that some black holes have these powerful jets, but others do not, most do not. So you have to have a theory that first allows you to have these powerful emissions, but also that you have to be describing an object in which some have more and some have less, and then some are turned on and some are not turned on. And we do have that theory now. It's published. And um, in this theory, we are now, explain, as I say, explaining the existence in some, but not all, quasars of this jet structure, which persists enormously long uh, ways off into space. Enormously long being maybe a distance that it takes light a thousand years to cover. So we have these objects that are not the classical black hole from which not even light can escape. They have other properties. Did someone just leave the conversation? I heard a blip on Skype. Uh, I see. I'm, I'm missing the picture of Edgar. Okay. Um, Edgar, are you there? I think he dropped out. I mean, he, yeah, what, whatever happened here. Um, okay, let's consider this interrupted, I presume, Ray, uh, Ralph, or do you want yeah, to continue? Yeah, I'm going to call him right now. Oh. Hold on. Are you there still? Hi, Edgar, you dropped out. Are you still are you there now? Yeah, we're back. Okay. All right. Let me try to get Rudy back. Hold on. They just equipment failed on us. Okay. Rudy, are can you hear me? Hello, Rudy. Okay, I'm gonna have to, to call his link back. He's actually using his wife's Skype. Just a minute here. <clears throat> well, they're still supposedly that still on. Answer the question of what we do if the universe burns out or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> that's right. It's a big bang is occurring now again. <laughs> Hello, Rudy. Can you hear me? What I think I'll have to do is to terminate Rudy and call him back. So just give me a, a moment here. All right. I'm trying to figure out how this occurred and what to do about it. Uh, meanwhile, I'm sending messages to TJ now, uh, text messages. Okay. Okay, your call failed. Yeah. Oh. Hello? Hello? Let's take a, let's take a little break. Yeah, together. yeah. Why, don't, why don't you guys take a break and I'll try to, to get yeah. this put back together. I see Kathy must be assistant in your car. She has somebody in Hey, Ralph, we, we yeah. have to do another group call. Yeah, yeah, we got to connect everybody. I, th I think that uh, in Florida they're taking a, a quick pee break or something. Okay. But, um, yeah, Edgar dropped out suddenly, and I called him back, but when I tried to reconnect with Rudy, I couldn't I couldn't get him, I couldn't hail him, but it showed that he was still connected. Yeah, we all disconnected now, so we'll be able to reconnect. Okay. 
All right, so I'll just go ahead and and try these these links just one at a time. Yeah. Okay. Are you getting good audio? Oh yeah, perfect. Couldn't be better. Cool. Because we have uh, separate audio recorders on Edgar and Rudy that mm-hmm. will send you. Good. 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 Yeah, it, it's certainly workable on my end. I'm recording my studio voice on a local mic, and so we're going to get good sound. I'm not worried about that. Mm. Hello, Rudy. Hi, do you see me? I hear you, Ralph. Yes, and I'm going to try to patch it all together when Good. The, when the, the link dropped. I think Edgar went to take a pee or something. Let me just see if I can hail him. Hi, Edgar. I, I see. Is that Giorgio? Yeah. Hi, yeah. I see you there. And he's coming back. Okay, there they are. Okay, I have Rudy on the line. And let me see if I can patch this whole conference back together. Okay, we're waiting for you. We're okay. watching. Okay, we've got. Oh, R- Ralph, there's one issue that Edgar, uh, we put on uh, Edgar's um, a video on sustainability. Uh, on our website a while back ago. Okay. Um, and I don't think we've touched that topic uh, much, but I know it was a, a dear subject uh, to Edgar. Okay. Well, we can talk about it, but what you talk about it, it says that uh, the, our see, see, planet you know, has a finite lifetime, that's all. See, you know, I'm really happy about about quantum physics and, the, and how many universes there are, and how do you know? <laughs> But it's good at kind of Okay, um I'm Edgar Edgar, can you hear me? Can hear you. I can't see you. Okay, well I don't have a camera set up because a microphone is blocking my face. So that's the reason you don't see me. Um but I'm just trying to get the, the group call back assembled. Uh Rudy, do you hear me? I don't know. I guess I've lost Rudy. Let me try to do this again. If I didn't yeah. have that experience, so I okay, guess. Rudy. Rudy, I, I, I'm in. A, I'm in a situation with the, the group call where it's either one of, or the other of you, and I must be doing something wrong here, and I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I would say don't worry about me being bored or whatever. We are fine. I would say that your highest priority is to get Ed, get this out of Edgar. Okay. Uh, but but the, I'm willing to do whatever uh, you find. Uh, they're probably scrambling back there in Florida. No, they're sitting at, at their at the computer, and I was just talking to Edgar and Ray. But the the problem is that when I try to toggle all all three of us in, it becomes one or the other from my end. So I'm able yeah. to speak to you, but when I click on Edgar, you drop out and you're put on hold. Yeah. Now, I could imagine you're finishing the interview with just Edgar and are doing this at a later time or a, a completely other time. It's your call, Ralph. Well, I'm willing to okay. do whatever uh, whatever works best for you. This is a, a critical point for you. Okay. Let me just – I still want to make it work because we had a flow and an interaction. And if that doesn't work, we'll do it one at a time. I'll, I'll go back and forth between you two and ask you questions. So just a second here. All right. Hi, I'm, I have a, a strange situation where I can only talk to either of you one at a time. And it's, I'm having problems reassembling the three-way group conference. Can you hear me? On your uh, I can hear you here, Ralph. Okay. So I don't know what to do about that. It's, uh, you know, when... when it, before ta- it was TJ that had hooked us all, all up. Oh, okay. Rudy just dropped out. Um, let me. Oh my so see, God. See, see if TJ sends it to everybody, and then we can pick up. Right. If that's how we did it last time. Okay. Well, let let me let me call TJ and see what I can do with that. Just 
give me a second here. Uh, Edgar is on a blank white screen. Right, right. I had to disconnect him because I was... Hi, right, TJ, can you hear me? So... Hello? I heard hello. But... Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey Ralph, I'm uh, on the phone with Ray. Okay. okay. I, uh, I, uh, I have a problem where I can either I can talk, talk to Rudy or Edgar, but I can't have them both on at the same time. Can you give me any pointers on that? Yeah, I'm trying to make sure on Edgar's side is hung up. It's not on hold because I don't think he can get it through if he is on hold. Tell him that you hung up here. Yeah, and I hung up on Rudy's computer, so that should be good to go. Okay. Okay, um, Okay, Ray. So on Edgar's computer, he should be on his main Skype screen, and he shouldn't be on hold or on a call with anybody. No, you should just be on your main Skype screen. It shouldn't be on a phone call with anybody. No, I know. I'm I'm trying to figure it out myself as we go along. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to try to call a group call aggregate and see if I can ring both of them at the same time, okay? Because I have it, I have it assembled right here. Hold hold on, Ray. Okay, Ralph, I'm going to hang up. I'm going to hang up on this one. Yeah. Just so you can put me through on the group. Okay. 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 Okay, I think we're back, and we have a three-way with the silent TJ in the background. Uh, Edgar, can you hear me? Can we hear your video? Yes, we hear Okay, and Rudy, I see you as well. Yes, and I hear you. Okay, so Edgar, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, we're back. We're back. All right, so let's pick up the program where we left off. And uh, Ray, you were suggesting that oh. Edgar address oh. the issue of sustainability because we have an article posted on the website regarding that topic. So would you like to frame a question, Ray? And go ahead and let's bring in, bring it in. No, um, oh, oh, Edgar yeah, has... Um, you. Hold on a second. Um, Edgar has a video on our website that he recorded... Was it the, the oh, the cup. Yeah. Uh, Edgar, so the cup. Blocking the... Image. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, we placed a, a video that Edgar made a couple of years ago on sustainability and the need for humanity to change its ways. And I would like to give you, uh, a bit of a little bit of a question so Edgar could, could address that. And I remember those uh, little, little children that were in the videos. Yeah, well, what to address except we've got an, a, vid, a video on sustainability that okay. people need to pay attention to. Okay. So um, maybe Ralph. Um, sure, I, I can. Question: um, We're in a situation, Doctor Mitchell, where we are destroying the life support system of our planet at an alarming rate. This has been advancing now at an accelerating speed with climate change and contamination of our biosphere. And there needs to be a way to address this problem so that humanity can take decisive action before a tipping point is reached. What suggestions do you have to give to mm -hmm. people who are concerned about sustainability on planet Earth and the preservation of human civilization? Well, the only thing way we're going to be able to do anything about it is to get the word out so that everyone uh, is starts to be concerned on an individual basis because it's going to take all of us uh, doing what we can to eliminate what is damaging our sustainability. And that's overpopulation and overconsumption. So we got to have fewer people 
and uh, and perhaps quit eating so much. And this is, from my perspective of having been an environmentalist for nearly half a century, the most critical thing. And yet we have financial interests and vested interests and reactionary viewpoints and anti-science viewpoints that are preventing movement in this critical life-sustaining direction. How do we deal with the problem of reticence in our society to take this one on and to respond to it like it like it should be responded to in a timely way? Well, the sim- there's only one answer, and that's individuals must take on for themselves the idea that their life has to be devoted towards sustaining the greater good. And that means doing what they have to do in their life uh, to do their part of it. And that means living, live, living in that lifestyle. And are we? Well, I try to, but I don't know whether I'm successful or not, but we all have to try to or it's not going to work. Ralph, may I? Um, yes, go, go here? ahead, doctor. Um, so, um, thank you, Edgar. And I want to um, give you an encouraging observation that um, among the young people in my life, and mind you, this is coming from somebody living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which may be among the more enlightened cities on the planet, but nonetheless, in the people in my life, I do see a fantastically greater awareness of these problems than ever existed when I was their age, say, when I was 20-something. I think that the grandchildren in my family... And I think that the people that I'm seeing in the university departments all are reflecting the need, the perceived need, for us to become more efficient in our use of our resources and to waste as little as possible. So I have a fairly optimistic spin to put on it. I am aware that there are other forces afoot who uh, are focused entirely on the costs the dollar costs associated with it, and are thinking about how they would rather spend that money in some other way. But um, I think that these issues will be before us for a very long time. But there is an optimistic side to our evolution that I have seen in my lifetime. Thank you. I'm glad you've seen it, Rudy. We're dealing with a very disturbing phenomenon that we need to address in this context, and that is the <clears throat> purveyance of scientific ignorance or or disregard of scientific uh, fact. Uh, you have uh, climate change deniers that are tied to fossil fuel companies tweaking the votes in Congress and denying funding for environmental agencies and so forth. You have religious people who deny the existence of climate change. All of this pressure amounts to political inaction within the government of the one country on earth that could make the most difference if it were to move toward sustainable technology. So how do we deal with the prevalence of, of ignorance of scientific principles? I mean, it, it pervades all the way through the educational system, the resist, resistance to even the concept of biological evolution. Ignorance of science, it was something that Carl Sagan was very concerned about toward the end of his life. Well, I think one simple answer or oversimplified answer is talk louder, those of us who believe in it. We just do more. That's all we can do. Very good, Edgar. Talk louder or even shout. And I think that we do that. In other words, um, again, on the optimistic note, I do hear people uh, in in the young group talking more and more about it, but um, it might be that um, that's not being adequately heard still, so I don't want to um, uh, downplay anything Edgar says. Talk louder. Do either of you believe that awareness of the UFO situation and the possible visitation of our planet from advanced civilizations has anything to do with sparking public awareness and consciousness that could lead toward more sustainable policies? I definitely think so, yes. Could you amplify that? Well, seeing the bigger picture, I mean, 
both Rudy and I tend to be cosmologists in the sense of we ask the deeper questions of how does all this working? Where did it come from? Where is it going? We, the more people we get asking those types of questions, even though you may not be a professional cosmologist, uh, you have to be aware that that is the question we're asking. Where is all this going? And how does it get there? How do we get it there? And we get it there by the cho- choices we make. And we've got to make the right choices. And right now, since we're not on a sustainable path, it's clear we're making the wrong choices. We've got to do better. And I think that, in fact, if you listen to what many of the abductees are saying, and Ralph, you may have some opinions about this or have some information about this yourself, um, I've heard that in the traditional literature of the abductees, is the very strong statement that the aliens had been warning the individuals they're contacting that we do have a very serious problem, that it is perhaps the most difficult challenge that we face as a civilization, and that we had better do something to clean up our planet because it's the fragile thing. And um, I'm a frequent visitor at... Native American gatherings, I wouldn't say frequent, but say an annual visitor, because um, that community, the Native American community, has long felt that one of the principal um, challenges to our civilization is the preservation of our Mother Earth. And so I believe that there are forces from our own historic past joining with new information coming from aliens uh, to abductees shown often as apocalyptic visions of a possible future that would be terrible, but which we may be approaching. Those things seem to be coming together in our civilization, and that would be the optimistic side. We've formed a new organization that you two gentlemen are a part of. In fact, I consider you co-founders of this organization. It's called the, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. The acronym is FREE. That's intentional. And it's a, it's a group that's composed of scientists, lay investigators, and contact experiencers. So here for the very first time, to my knowledge, we have a formal organizational structure, a network of people willing to accept such diversity to where scientists are now willing to listen to experiencers and to work with contact experiencers rather than to walk away from the seemingly outrageous and challenging things that they describe. What is the importance of such a development? From my vantage point as a journalist, it seems quite provocative. But as scientists, you two gentlemen are are participating members of this. Is this free organization something that people should be paying attention to? Um, So if I may, Edgar, um, I very much feel so. And that's why I have um, engaged with the organization. And... Um, I want to add to all the things that you said about the free organization, Ralph, that free has an independent investigating side, a program of psychological research being undertaken by uh, Dr. John Klimo, and he um, is already surveying the uh, abductee community that is now responding to free with their information. And um, the first survey has now been completed and is being analyzed and has approximately 500 uh, participants. And that is would be viewed as a significant number. And I believe that what should be done, according to your statements, Ralph, is that we should make the environmental impact of um, the UFO program, an important item of uh, investigation so that um, we have something to say in our publication of the survey results. I would like there to be more hard evidence of what the alien position is on the matter of, of ecological development because 
I think it is a favorable one to further ecology awareness. Dr. Mitchell? Go ahead. Do, uh, let Rudy say what, what he just said all over again with my voice, and you'll have a good answer. <laughs> Okay. Well, I do want to get your voice on this because what we're going to do is to present uh, both of you as spokespeople here. Um, Dr. Mitchell, what do you think the free organization? Why do you think the free organization is important at this particular point in time, and and what role could it play in advancing human knowledge? Well, I think it's doing a valuable service in bringing this this issue to the attention of more and more people. It's It is a a promotional uh, mechanism for the very ideas and problems that we need need to solve. And so the more we can reach out and touch more lives and awaken more people uh, at a faster rate to very problems we're all facing, that's a good thing to do. And I uh, commend uh, uh, commend, uh, all that have been involved with the free organization we're helping you get going. I'd like to sort of, as we begin to wrap up, I'd like to move back into some issues that we tackled at the very beginning of the interview. And Dr. Mitchell, why investigate for you? What is the motivation? Why did you start investigating inner space after returning from outer space? That was such very simple. It's because for 500 years, it had one of the most important parts of our world, of our understanding, of our doing what we do, uh, um, being aware and being conscious was not a proper subject for science to take a look at. And that's what uh, my Noetic Foundation set out to do. And first of all, we had to define science or consciousness in scientific terms and that has happened not due to necessarily our organization alone but a lot of people involved in doing that and some very uh, uh, wonderful folks that have helped us along the way here by doing the in the laboratories doing experiments uh, uh, one of the first persons that I contacted and brought into this was uh, Dr was Uri Geller from uh, Israel to begin with, but he now lives in England. Uh, he was one of our subjects. And uh, <clears throat> Dr. Hal Putoff, which may even be listening to this program at the time, uh, who worked with us, and Russell Targ, and a whole host of individuals who are quite well aware of the very problems we talk about, and I know or will jump on it, uh, help us in any way that they can uh, one day when the time is right for them. Dr. Shield, do you have any comment as to why it's important to explore inner space as a physicist? Yes, very much so. Um, I think that in agreement with what Dr. Mitchell has said, there are some phenomenal um, research projects that are being done within his former IONS organization and elsewhere also. But from within, we have the experiments that were done by the director about the direct influence of a laser interferometer, a physical instrument, by consciousness. And I believe that we can see that if such an experiment can be reproduced, can be repeated and confirmed, it shows that consciousness is very much more powerful than we had ever imagined. And so I would like to first talk a little bit about what the experiment was. In the first place, then, you have to imagine that um, subjects are brought into a room and sat in front of a computer, much like the one I'm facing right now, And the computer gives them a randomly generated signal, um, show your concentration now, and occasionally, now turn it off your concentration. In between, a laser interferometer was being 
uh, asked to define through um, observations and laboratory techniques whether a Young's slit experiment was behaving more quantum-like or more classic-like. And so when the results were in and the concentration on and concentration off a signal was compared with the laser interferometer signal, it was shown that to a good statistical accuracy, when the subjects concentrated strongly, the laser was more likely to act as a quantum device. And when they were shut down in consciousness, then the interferometer was likely to act more physical. And interestingly, it turned out that people with a long history of meditative practice were able to influence the laser interferometer instrument more powerfully. So there is a direct experiment which shows you that the mind can alter a physical system, can alter a machine. And so if that's the case, then why couldn't a UFO spacecraft amplify that same consciousness and do tricks like relocate itself? Very yeah. interesting. And that experiment was done by Dean Radin, who is currently the executive director of the Institute for, of Noetic Sciences, which was started by our guest, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, back in 1973. So that's a remarkable experiment, uh, Rudy. I'm glad that, that you brought it up, and it does demonstrate the principle that thought interacts on a quantum level with physical reality that we can measure. And I think that the key point is to be able to prove to the scientific community that the subjective experiences that are often discounted in scientific uh, discourse are physical, they're present, and it's the quantum structure of space and time that make that connection possible and therefore our physics needs to be expanded to encompass that quantum reality which is also an information reality because we're dealing with the transmission of pattern and resonance which means intelligence beautifully said ralph thank yeah. you yeah. <laughs> i got my licks in after all not just asking <laughs> questions here <laughs> okay well i think we're we're Oh, hitting the two-hour mark, and there's got to be room in the broadcast for announcements and summaries and transitions, and yes, there will be commercials on KGRA as well. So now we can sort of move into freeform, and I can edit a lot of these things together and switch them around once all the footage is assembled. It's a lot of work, but we're going to have a very clean and smooth program, and it'll be a joy to listen to both of you. But I'd like to try to move the conversation into more of a free form and just to talk about some of the currents that have moved both of you as individuals, as human beings, as scientists. I know that, uh, Dr. Mitchell, you've had quite an extraordinary life, uh, both in the military and in, in science. Uh, you have had that touch of Roswell in your early years, in your, in your teen years, that... Uh, it signaled to you that something was different. And I don't know whether in the back of your mind, having grown up in New Mexico, had anything to do with how you viewed space exploration once you got to the moon, but I sort of suspect it may have. Am I correct in that suspicion? Well, I would say the most important thing was the attitude of my parents. I was raised with a very good parents who focused me um, on the way that's been successful for me in life. Uh, I, I give my parents great credit for the successes I have had uh, well, throughout my life, and I have been successful at most everything, and I attribute that to the rearing that I had at home and near Roswell. It's that, uh, I guess, that integrity culture you're describing. I know I've been to New Mexico and I've interacted with it, and I was quite impressed. So it, it endures to this day. Dr. Shield, do you have a, a comment apropos to what Edgar was stating? Um, 
it's hard to for me um, to thank. Um, uh, this is a little bit like the Oscars program, isn't it? <laughs> I want to thank my mom and my dad and Edgar Mitchell and others who have gone before, <laughs> and uh, the students who empower me now. All of that. Um, I would actually like to most thank the many people who have suffered the trauma of first encountering beings from off planet and um, endured the cultural, social, and uh, just human shock of this, and who have then gone on to try to wise up the rest of us. Um, there are countless books available by, written by people who feel they must share their participation in this extraterrestrial experiment, and I want to thank all of them for their very courageous stance. I know that there are many anecdotes of families that have been broken up because one member of the family just got too weird. Um, so these people have shown a great deal of courage and very often an integrity to um, the, the part of the universe that the science community has preferred to totally neglect. Um, I find it appalling that we are structured in our scientific research community in such a way that the entire subject of UFOs uh, and of contact with alien beings is not considered a legitimate topic for discussion. So, for example, I think you know I'm the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cosmology. But we have discovered that if we are to be perceived as an academically based journal with our publications based on the writings of the most respected academics in our civilization, we must not ever publish the word UFO or description of abduction. It is simply taboo. It is understood by the student population that you will not publish a thesis on UFO research. That would be uh, unthinkable. And um, I don't know uh, what the astronomy community would make of it if you t did so anyway. So far as I know, it has never been done. Now, how amazing is that? It's quite amazing considering that Dr. John Mack hailed from your university and struggled for many years to bring that subject into the mainstream and was castigated and nearly ejected from Harvard for dealing with the abduction subject. In fact, it was even worse. Dr. Mack uh, confided to me personally that in addition to the Harvard University action against his tenure as a professor at Harvard University, there was further intent to disbar him from the psychiatric profession altogether. Now recall that Dr. John Mack was introduced to this topic by patients, people who, as I have said before, suffered personal traumas from their contacts with these alien intelligent beings. And this trauma so affected their lives that they um, sought professional help, but found there was none or almost none to be found. And so it is that um, um, the subject, from its very outset, has had no university participation, and this remains true today. And curiously, we invest a great deal of financing of projects in astronomy to characterize the atmospheres of remote planets. This is an activity that has started and gotten underway in the last 10 years, which is about the time frame in which we've collected together the identifications of now literally thousands 
of planets orbiting distant stars, suns like our own. My own research has taught me that um, planets actually are what made the stars in the sense that the universe made planet-like structures. They didn't have a core when they were made. They accumulated the core and that these structures then made the stars. And it's therefore not surprising, in fact, even a prediction that every star in the sky has a family of planets around it. So it's astonishing that we find financial support for the purpose of studying remotely the nature of planets where we can just go to a handful of individuals who report visiting these planets and can tell us a great deal about the atmospheres, about the appearance of the night sky, about the appearance of the daytime sky, of the mineral nature of the planet surfaces, and about the nature of the atmospheres, about the kinds of atmospheric and aerial phenomena, their northern lights displays, for example. All of it is already documented within the UFO literature and, unfortunately, entirely ignored in the academic approach. So this is something that could be redressed, but I am not attempting to do it single-handedly with the Journal of Cosmology. And the reasons why probably give you some hint as to even larger forces in our civilization. Beautifully summarized, Rudy. I, I really appreciate that, that long statement. It's going to be used in many different contexts, not just within this program. Uh, for both of you, Edgar and Rudy, I'm going to break this interview up. Uh, it will be featured mostly in its entirety during the kickoff edition of The Other Side of the Universe, which will be broadcast within probably a month. But I will sprinkle excerpts from this long discourse into further editions of the show as we bring on other members of the free core group, <clears throat> other experiencers, researchers, people who are involved in this subject area, and it'll just be an ongoing potpourri. So I thank just you. Just a minute, that. Ralph. Just a minute, Ralph. Don't sign off. I didn't. I'm, I'm well, here. We still have Edgar in front of the camera. <laughs> We're not leaving. I'm not signing okay. off. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ralph, if I may interject, um, to bring up a topic that we brought some time ago, Edgar Mitchell has mentioned to us, um, uh, to me personally, that um, in addition to the evidence about regarding these Roswell crash, that he had a separate experience of its significance, which occurred when he was a young postdoc, I think working already for... Uh, the uh, the preceding organization to NASA, and it was occurred at a banquet in the company of Ferner von Braun, the paperclip scientist brought to the United States by the United States government at the end of World War II. He had been a German rocket scientist and was brought now to New Mexico, Edgar State, uh, where the um, White Sands Missile Range became... Uh, Werner von Braun's new home, but at a cocktail reception honoring his new presence in the United States, Edgar Mitchell had a story for me. Edgar, are you willing to repeat that story about the cocktail reception with Werner von Braun? I can't, frankly, I can't remember it now, Rudy. I, I vaguely remember what you're talking about, but I can't pull back the details of it. Would you like me to attempt to recall it? Please. Go right ahead. Edgar, what you told me at the time was that you had just yourself only recently arrived at White Sands. You had, uh, had completed your degree, your Doctor of Science degree at MIT, and were now at our rocket site, uh, White Sands. And um, White Sands is, of course, close to Almogordo, where, as I recall, the campus of the University of New Mexico um, is located. 
Whatever. And there has always been a connection between White Sands and the university, just like the Caltech JPL connection. And that there was, with the arrival of Werner von Braun, a cocktail reception where you stood around with the others, uh, glass in hand, and uh, uh, you were all meeting each other and hopefully having some things to say to each other. And this was interrupted at one moment when an aide in, as I recall, you said government uniform, in fact, approached Dr. von Braun, tapped him on the shoulder and said in his ear, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. von Braun, a very important telephone call for you. At this point, Dr. von Braun left the room. When he returned to the room, just a few minutes later, you said he was white, ashen-faced. He was speechless for the moment. Obviously, thunderstruck. And that, the day of this event of the cocktail party was the day after the Roswell, Roswell crash. Do you remember this now? I'm vaguely, but uh, I had forgotten most of the details that you're uh, talking about. I do not remember his reaction at this point. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. It's very interesting, gentlemen, because... Uh, a colleague of mine and and of Edgar's uh, 15, 20 years ago was a woman named Dr. Carol Rosen. And Edgar, you may recall Carol Rosen. She was involved with the Disclosure Project. Yes, yeah, she was Werner's secretary. Yes. At so, one point. That's right. She was recruited by Dr. Von Braun in 1974. She had been a school teacher in New Jersey, and she had some sort of project to uh, space training for children and Dr. Von Braun got wind of that and hauled her in and was very impressed by her organizational and executive caliber uh, talents. And so he made her his administrative assistant. And as she was drawn into his confidence, and, this is, and Carol told me this uh, verbatim, so I'm, I'm basically describing pretty much what she told me 15 years ago, that he be, he placed her in a position to become the first female director on the board of directors of Fairchild Industries, which was his corporation. And when she was in that position, he then disclosed to her that he's very concerned that Fairchild and a number of other companies had been recruited into some sort of covert project to sell the notion of war with extraterrestrials to the American public over a gradual period of time to boost their bottom line. That this was a, a long-standing game plan that had several phases. And that when he found out about that, he objected to it. And the reason that he brought Carol Rosen onto the board of directors is to provide a counterpoint to the thrust of of that particular defense contractor toward antagonism with extraterrestrial civilizations. And he was very concerned about building weapons that could be used in outer space, that, that we were on a collision course with our own survival and with advanced civilizations that had capabilities far, far greater than ours, and that the militarization of space would would signal our own doom from many fronts. And so he enlisted her in fighting the militarization of space. And to this day, Carol is the, is the founder of an, the Institute for Cooperation, Peace and Cooperation in Space. She worked very closely with the Federation of American Scientists. Its former executive director, John Pike, used to be, uh, used to be her uh, employee. At, the, at her space foundation, and she's been a tireless worker in this regard ever since her relationship with Dr. Von Braun. So toward, toward the end of his life, Werner Von Braun had a change of heart and began to think in a much larger expanse. And, and if what Rudy is describing is accurate about your encounter with Dr. Von Braun on, I would say, probably July 8th, 1947, if that phone call came in on that date, if that's when you met him, uh, Dr. Uh, Mitchell, that that 
incident could have very well been the transformative pivotal point in the awakening of Werner von Braun, which led him to become an advocate for the demilitarization of space toward the end of his life. Now that you, I've heard this, that you brought it all back, and I do remember it. I pushed it out of my mind a long time ago. But yes, you're right. That is the right story. That's the way it happened. My God. Well, now that you remember some of it, can you go into some detail about that day? No, I can't. Uh, I cannot remember about the day except for the fact that I was flabbergasted that uh, Dr. Von Braun was ready to go toward total being a total peacenik as far as uh, keeping humankind uh, uh, out of space wars or uh, that sort of activity, and that all of his activities, and Carol Rosen, whom I dearly care for, has been a friend for all these years, uh, the whole mission here is to keep uh, space wars from not happening. Have you? Did you have any subsequent conversation with Dr. Von Braun after that July 1947 phone call? Uh, no. But, I mean, it was a... Once it was said once, that was a gone conclusion. Just didn't do it anymore. What What did he say when he came back from the call? Or is it just the, the, the date that sticks in mind? Was there any content disclosed to I you? I can't remember that. Just the date. And just remember the circumstances of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be an event taking place in on the Cinco de Mayo, this is the year 2015 for the record, and Jaime Masson, the news reporter of television news in Mexico, who is also that nation's premier UFO reporter, is helping to pull together researchers in the field of, Ro of the Roswell case that have been looking into photographic evidence, controversial, but, but very convincing, slides that purport to show one of the alien cadavers in a cylinder of glass that date back to 1947. The slides have been authenticated in terms of their chemistry and their age. They were found in a uh, collection of slides from that time period, all of them Kodachromes. This particular group, two slides among 400, were hidden away in a chest uh, of slides that were amassed by a prominent couple, uh, a woman and a man who were, the, the husband was very close to the petroleum industry in Texas, and they apparently were, might have been close to the Eisenhowers and to the Eisenhower administration and their entourage, because they got very close to these people and were able to photograph them during Dwight Eisenhower's 1948 tour of the United States. So there are slides perfect condition of slides, but then hidden in a little compartment in this chest of, of slides were these two slides with, that appear to be of uh, 1947 vintage that could very well be authentic photos of the bodies extracted from Roswell. And Dr. Rosen is involved with Jaime Masson to stage a world press conference in Mexico City on Cinco de Mayo 2015 to release this information specifically to the world. And a major television documentary is being produced about this case. So y your friend Dr. Rosen is involved at that level as well. And I don't know if you're involved with this or have been notified about it. Well, I am quite, I have been invited to participate. And uh, I think the real issue here is the authenticity of those particular slides. I don't think that's been well enough established. But uh, uh, the, all the rest of it, I've talked to uh, Hassan. And yes, I've been invited to be one of the speakers there. And at the moment, uh, those plans are, are in force. And I am uh, getting ready. I'm planning to go, or at least getting all of the details. For the way hey. so okay, yes. Yeah, I, I've been keeping tabs on this particular event, and like you, I also question the authenticity of the slides, and that needs to be established before anyone uh, holds a, a major media convulsion. And, I don't know how we're going to do that either. Yeah, I, I think that, that Jaime Masson is doing the wrong thing by grandstanding on this. That's, that's my opinion. 
I, t I tend to be more conservative when it comes to providence and evidence. And I'm also a media person, so I have both both feet in both worlds. And caution has to win out, otherwise you'll torpedo the, the credibility of the Roswell case for another 30 years. I agree. Well, Ralph, can, um, one item I want to relate to, uh, to Rudy, and I've related to Edgar, is that uh, Rudy raised the point of uh, so many experiencers of ET contact have been traumatized um, and also stigmatized by society in not having anyone to talk to. And Edgar and I have had that conversation because, uh, uh, you know, Edgar has informed me that many people over the years have come to him with uh, many stories. And I'm sure, Rudy, you have spoken with many people as well. And so one of the th projects that Free is undertaking is we have a program called Experiencer Buddy, which we're hooking up someone that's had an experience to talk with someone else who has had many years of interacting with these ETs, uh, at least a, a listening ear, someone to talk to. And over the last four months, we've uh, helped 128 people. Uh, also, another project we're, that we're starting is an ex a sort of like a, a social movement for experiencers to be able to change the climate of our society where one can freely speak out about these experiences. Uh, Rudy, you know some of the medical doctors that we have in free, but they're hiding in the closet. They can't come out and, and, and talk about their experiences. Uh, you've had several phone calls with one medical doctor in particular. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to try to change the climate of society, and we're starting something called Experience Your Day, um, and, and little by little take off on that. Well, let me jump in, uh, and I'm sure Ralph, you'll agree, John Mack, uh, and I know that uh, Rudy will too, John Mack suffered greatly from uh, being a pioneer mm -hmm. in uh, having people come to him and he had a pretty rough life because of that. But he did a marvelous job of getting this all started by uh, being listening to these people and listening to their stories and being a stalwart and uh, standing there saying, okay, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you, when uh, uh, everybody else was saying how silly it all was. Well, you, Edward, you you are the poster child for that. <laughs> for you were like pretty much the father of modern disclosure study, um, and you also have suffered greatly uh, in, in your life by by coming out publicly for you know thirty years now. Well, that no, it's never bothered me whatsoever. <laughs> I couldn't care less what people think about it. It's what I know. And I think I Edgar is. I think Edgar is being much more congratulated for having devoted his career you know, the second half, the post-landing half, to the study of these phenomena. He landed with a firm conviction, based on his Samadhi experience, that there is a psychic universe out there, that these phenomena are happening to people. And it's not only just the alien abduction experience, but it's uh, remote viewing, it's ecstatic experience and resonance with the universe. And he's asked the question very profoundly, what is this? How does this work? And for that reason, he's devoted the entire second half of his career. I think that's the most amazing thing. Well, thank you. Edgar, I congratulate and salute you. Thank you. Here, here to both of you. I, I feel the same way. Edgar has been a mentor from afar for me for many, many years. And when I first met you, Edgar, at Asilomar in 1995, I was most struck by the fact that you stood up in the mess hall at the Asilomar Conference Center at lunchtime and said you would do whatever it takes to bring this disclosure process forward. And you and on the, a direct quote was, you can count on me. And Stephen Greer and I both were there and saw it and witnessed that statement. Well, thank you. Yeah. Very Congratulations, moving. Edgar. <laughs> You've lived that life. And also, uh, to the, getting back to the point, Edgar's information and the information that you're putting out, Rudy, and so many other quote-unquote credible individuals, you know, scientists, academics, whatever, that is so important to experiencers because, first of all, uh, they are seeing that they're not crazy because so many people, half of the members of our board 
that are experiencers, they've got the psychiatrist at one point. They've, they've taken medications, <laughs> but it's statements by Edgar and Rudy and so many others and, and them learning about it uh, to know that this is a valid phenomenon that's very real, that they're not going crazy. And now, and now um, Ray, some accolades for you too. Uh, you have devoted some years of your life to this project as well. And um, I really like that buddy project that you're describing now because, you know, I have met some people who have been so traumatized by these experiences that they have first withdrawn to just try to understand for themselves how they're going to conceptualize what has happened to them. But then they face uh, the second shock, which is when they try to go outside of themselves and get some kind of human contact with another person who would s listen sympathetically because most people just don't want to hear about it. And so I know of one or two individuals who've talked to me who um, have just been reaching out and to just will one person listen to me? <laughs> and I did listen. Okay. And I believe that your organization is now in a position to put these people together. And I think that the, the, this, the power of the universe will be with you. The force is with you. Yeah, For Great. our listening audience, I just want to summarize what this project is. Ray has brought it up. And it's a survey that is posted on the free website, the free website experiencer.co. All of you listening who would like to participate and to perhaps tell your story, go to experiencer.co and activate the primary survey vehicle. What you can do is answer questions about who you are, all of it anonymous, but just in terms of categories, and describe whether or not you've seen UFOs, whether or not you've seen beings, answer questions about them. And these are being put into a database, an interactive database, to aggregate enough respondents to make a difference statistically so that we can glean some overall knowledge as to the nature of the experience. Is it positive? Is it negative? Preponderance, what is it? Rather than jumping to hyperbolic conclusions about the phenomenon that we're being invaded by hostile aliens and so forth. We need to explore the fine points of the phenomenon before we jump to conclusions about it. And that could settle a lot of questions and begin a different kind of communication and dialogue in our country and around the world. So the goal of this survey is scientific, it's sociological research, but it's also supporting the experiencer community. It's organized in three tiers of research, preliminary questions, which sort the responses, secondary questions, which get more uh, subjective and personalized. And by the time you get to the third level of the survey, you're actually handling the content of individual cases and the specifics of individual narratives. And then people, if they want, will be video interviewed on Skype to be made available to our research committee. So this is a, an unprecedented project. It's being organized by Dr. John Klimo, who is an academic with more than 40 years experience in uh, social science, as well as the study of the paranormal and of uh, the channeling phenomenon. He's very well equipped to understand and to coordinate the effort. I'm working with him. Ray is working with him. So it's one of the the, the main pillars of what the organization FREE, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, is all about. And hopefully we can make a difference in the way people think about these issues. And Edgar wanted to say something about the support aspect of it, because just off camera, uh, he had told me that he has spoken with a lot of experiencers over the years. And when, when Rudy was saying they just want someone to talk to, Edgar was nodding his head. So I'm sure he's heard a lot of uh, stories. Well, that is all true, but not much more to say. I mean, we've already said yeah. it all. It's trying to get a, an idea that, that that isn't terribly popular, and that's to come out and tell these experiences about with ETs and UFOs and so forth. 
uh, people are very reticent to do it. But I think as we go forward, just doing this, it will become easier and the norm because it's reality. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Let's not worry about it. <laughs> okay. I think we've done it unless we have other issues that we need to focus on. Now that we have a stable Skype connection, the temptation is to continue this conference all day. And I, I, I know I can come up with more questions. We've got the things to do, so yeah. we've about wound this up. <laughs> okay. All right. Rudy, what, what's your part of the consensus here? Um, I'm, uh, I, have, I have no problems uh, and uh, have one or few, two more things that I would kind of like to comment to you, Ralph, um, because they may suggest topics for further exploration in a future broadcast. So maybe if I could talk to you about one more issue that I encounter in the field of astrotheology. Yes, by all means. So um, I'll, uh, we'll have some, uh, I guess, some, some check out from Edgar and uh, his, um, his camera crew. Uh, do you want to do that little bit of logistics with them, Ralph? And I'll stand by uh, for just uh, the 30 or 60 seconds. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Rick, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. <laughs> Let's, <laughs> Let's stay together for the duration. How about that? Don't write them off yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Ralph, if I might. Um, I think you know that um, as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cosmology, I have known for some time that the um, um, exploration of what is in the universe and how was it constructed, and in particular this keen point I made a minute ago about how it looks as though the universe was constructed in such a way that one entity could be supra to it all, and it's easiest to define that entity as the sum of it all. In other words, as pure mathematicians, if you tell me I have quanta of this and that and that and that, then as a mathematician, there has to be a sum of that. And so purely as a mathematical construct, but also then as potentially uh, an item of keen interest from the point of view of our basic philosophy, we would ask, what is the sum of that? And then I take it that, now this is me speaking, I think that the creator has to be all of that and maybe more. But has to be at least that. All of the communication and all of the knowledge in our physical universe. Now, when um, we explore this further, we notice that it's difficult to understand our universe as a simple quantum fluctuation, the way many physicists would like to describe it, as simply something that happened, and by, an, by chance it's pretty florid and kind of neat out there. Well, as physicists, we have to stand at the marvel of how finely tuned it must have been for us to have emerged as conscious sentient beings on planets, on, uh, rotating around stars, rotating around centers of galaxies, in clusters, and so on, all starting with a cloud of hydrogen. Just how does that work? And so um, the number of coincidences that it takes to make that work out is so large that it becomes virtually impossible like at odds less than one in a billion, for us to understand this as a statistical fluke. Now, there are other things that are in our universe that also seem to suggest that we have, as scientists, reason to accept a creator. This is a new topic in philosophical thought that is today sometimes called convergence. It starts with what Dr. Mitchell has described. Uh, in the Middle Ages, the church and science separated because science was quite sure of itself, just as the church professed great knowledge 
of the, what the nature of the world was. And so we see today a history of science and theology having diverged, and that for 400 years or so. But now I'm seeing convergence, and other people are saying the same thing. And so the things that, that, that feed the se sense of convergence are, one, the numerical coincidences that it takes to have adjusted the speed of light and Planck's constant and the gravitational constant and all of that in order for um, all of that, all of the universe to have worked. There's another one, and that is that it seems that the most likely the universe was formed first as a quantum reality. In other words, possibly two pre-existing mother universes were combined as information to create a daughter. This actually works the best for me. I believe this. Not on basic observations, but just on common sense. But anyway, then for two mothers to have created this daughter out of a quantum possibility, we know that it takes cos conscious energy to go from quantum possibility to physical reality. And so I have to ask the question, what consciousness brought the quantum potential for a universe into the physicalist of a universe where, as Edgar says, if I beat my head in a wall, I feel it. This isn't just a quantum universe. There's something there. It hurts. Um, so that's a second argument in what are considered sometimes to be three pillars of consciousness and three pillars supporting convergence to the concept of a creative intelligence. The third pillar you can find outlined in the Journal of Cosmology. Now, um, when I've talked about these concepts to theologians, that is, practicing preachers, mostly in the Episcopalian tradition recently, because those are the ones I have the most access to. But when I contact the keepers of the, uh, of the religion, they seem to be not really interested and even a little bit threatened. And I'm wondering if religion itself now is so concerned with its own self-preservation, wanting to be the keepers of the keys to heaven, so to speak, that they can't accept the accolades I give them for having gotten it right all along. They're the ones that were right all along. They told us that there's a God out there. And that's what convergence seems to be bringing us back to. So I just wanted to say that there's an even more complicated issue here in the acceptance of this broader picture of science and religion converging upon each other. And that is, not only does there seem to be reluctance by the science practitioners, but even the theological practitioners who seem not to see the greater importance of their tradition being now grounded more firmly in reality than ever in the history of our civilization. We live in an interesting time, and I invite more discussion of this. Perhaps the threat I, comes from the fact that science is validating the original picture and there's a threat to the, a social power structure that comes along with that. It's an interesting reactionary situation. I've pondered what you're describing, Rudy, for many years, and I, I don't know quite how to answer it, but I think a, a sociological study is called for. Why, why are theologians... Oh, no, Ralph, 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 slow down. <laughs> 
it's not true you don't know how to go forward. You're doing it right now. You're going forward. You are surrounding yourselves with those forces that are really thinking outside of the box mm -hmm. and asking them to comment in ways that will be acceptable and believable to one and all. Congratulations to you, Ralph. Thank you. You've hit it on the head. <laughs> Thank you, Rudy, for your explanation. You helped help us all see it, too. Thank you, Edgar. It means so much to hear from you. Okay. So, without further ado, do we have any other topics to cover, or should we call it a day? Gentlemen, we've been on the, online for two hours and 38 minutes. That's a record for, uh, for Dr. Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Ralph. All right. Take Tell care. us what to do now to break this up. Okay. Um, I will... I will put together a mix that will be seamless, but I'll, all I can do at this point is click a button and disconnect the conference, and that would be that. So, okay. All right. We'll Bye, Rudy. Bye, Rudy. All See right. You guys. Bye, guys. Also in the background. Okay. George, George. Yes, you're Ralph. Bye. Take okay, care. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.